We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. We do podcasts. We do video casts. Quizzes. Crowdcasts with famous authors. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you will never forget. There's only one way to make sure you get all of this. You get it in full and you get it first. And that's by becoming a supporter on Patreon. Details here. Word in Your Attic. A Zoom with a View. Well, it's another word in your attic. Now, it has to be said that it must have been very, very hard to stand out as a member of Roxy Music in 1972. But the one that always caught my teenage eye was the guitarist in the sensational sci-fi wraparound bug eye shades. The great (laughs) Phil Manzanera. Phil, lovely to see you. Hello. Good morning. Have you still got have you still got those shades? (laughs) Well, at the moment, thanks for reminding me, at the moment, (laughs) they're in the... uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame Museum in Cleveland. And oh, I, oh are they? I keep ask, trying to remember to ask for them back. <laughs> but I will have to um, make a, a fake copy <laughs> and send it to them because they are amazing. Obviously, they were made by Anthony Price, the yeah. designer. <clears throat> yeah. And, you know, I mean, it was totally brilliant. When, when, when we came to the photo shoot for the first album, um, actually, funny enough, I there didn't. it is. Oh. Let's have a look at you inside. And there, there I am. Right. <laughs> and um, you know, I got on the bus from Clapham. Uh, you know, this sort of, you know, I, I don't, I didn't go to art school. Uh, you know, I was a pretty sort of like uh, funky hippie dippy type person. So I got to the photo shoot, and Anthony said, "Oh my God, what are you wearing?" I think my mum, nice sweet <laughs> Colombian lady from Barranquilla. Uh, had sewn a few sort of glittery things on a shirt. <laughs> and, and you know, Anthony Price said, oh, my God, put these on, put this leather jacket on, you're done. And everything will be fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, here we know, are still talking about it, you know, <laughs> 50 years later or whatever. The, the, ultimate, lovely. the ultimate stylist. Yeah, it has become one of my signature things. Yeah, it's a shame. I would have worn them, obviously, if I had them here. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, but you can't really see very well out of them. I had to look down to play the guitar, so you know it, it wasn't it wasn't the easiest thing to actually use live. But there you go. So uh, speaking of South America, I wanted to fir- the first thing I wanted to show you in my attic is yep. this. Oh right! Oh lovely! Now this is a BOAC BOAC Strata- Stratacruiser. All oh, right. This was the actual plane that I went to Havana in 1957. Wow. And this is the actual plane, and it's got the actual correct thingy on it. So it's a rather lovely thing to have, and I have that on my desk. And, uh, you know, that is the reason this leads into why I end up playing the guitar, really. You know, because you I, were, you were born yeah. where you were born in England, then you moved, didn't you, to Colombia? Is that right with your no, your, mom, your mom's Colombian? No, my mom's Colombian, but no, in, I was born in London. Yeah, uh, uh, Big Ben. But you moved to Hawaii. That's right. Yeah. No, I, well, no, I did right. eventually. Um, <laughs> it's a long story. How long yeah. have you got? Um, no, my my, my dad uh, went to Havana in 1957 with my mom. My dad was a Brit. My mum was Colombian from Barranquilla. My dad had met her in, in uh, Barranquilla bef- just before the Second World War. He worked for the British Council. We think he was a spy. We always got sent to places where there was trouble. We went to Cuba in 1957 at exactly the same time that Graham Greene uh, was uh, sent to Havana, was writing our man in Havana in the yeah. hotel around the corner from his office. Yeah, uh, he was in MI6, Graham Greene, uh, and uh, we think, you know, my dad was, we've investigated that. But anyway, I don't want to go down that right. rabbit hole. So I, I was sent to a Cuban school, um, and within three months I could speak Spanish. And then my mum started having guitar lessons with her Italian friend because they wanted to sing and play. And she... she, she um, you know, being an inquisitive six, seven-year-old, I wanted to get my hands touch on everything. And she said, oh, for God's sake, stop. You know, I'll, I'll just have to teach you a few things. And uh, um, this is the actual guitar. Oh, wow. Oh, fantastic. Made in Havana in, 
Yeah, San Rafael, uh, Havana, made Echo in Cuba, 1957. There we Beautiful. go. Uh, and uh, it's out of tune, obviously, it doesn't stay in tune that long. <laughs> But uh, she taught me things like that, which is called acompañamiento. Yeah. So I, I started learning songs, which are Cuban songs and sp songs sung in Spanish, which if you go into any Spanish-speaking restaurant anywhere in the world, even today, and you start singing, the whole restaurant will start singing with you because everybody <laughs> knows these canon, <laughs> this canon of songs. And uh, Cielito Lindo and... Uh, well, there's a special one, Cuando Salí de Cuba. A lot of um, Cuban-Americans will, will know that one. Um, but so, yeah, I was, you know, I was listening to Cuban music when I was six or seven. I'd be taken by my parents to the, to the Tropicana Club and all the people who became famous later in the Buena Vista Social Club were at their prime. Oh, really? Then. Fantastic. So, so I was there and, you know, for... The next, um, say, 40 years or, 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 or 35 years, I wondered why no one else knew about these fantastic musicians and nobody ever asked about them. And suddenly, Ray Kuda and Ray the Kuda rebooted them, didn't they? Yeah. Rebooted the whole thing. <clears throat> um, so I was there, you know, um, we were there during the revolution. And this is the second thing I'm just going to show you. <clears throat> Actually, first of all, I'm going to show you a picture of me there I'm at age seven with a Fidelista machine gun in hand. Oh, wow. Good Lord. Um, in our front garden. Good grief. And he, there were gun battles from our garden and <clears throat> lots of scary stuff happened. And um, uh, there was a lot of looting. And, you know, uh, um, the dictator Batista fled on New Year's Eve. And, and uh, with all his chums. And um, so there was a lot of looting. So they, Fidel put guards on the houses and uh, of the ex chief of staff or something. We lived opposite the chief of staff of, of Batista. <clears throat> and so there was this guard, this guy here with his machine gun, sitting on a little seat um, all day, bored out of his brain. Um, stopping people coming and just filling their boots with all crystal and all sorts of stuff. And so I took him over a cup of coffee and, and, uh, and I said, can I go in? So I went into <laughs> to this rampaged house. And what does a uh, six, seven year old do? He looks for three or three gun shell bullets, but also he finds the guy's dinner jacket and takes his epaulette. Incredible. Off. And, and you can't really see it, but there's the escudo, the badge, yeah, the human yeah. badge. <laughs> and a photo album, which contained lots of pictures of British RAF people who sold planes to the dictator. I don't know if that's commonly known. Um, mysteriously, that book has disappeared. <laughs> But, you know, there's uh, some interesting stuff for a documentary there about the about, uh, UK role in, in, uh, in the revolution and supporting the dictator. So, um, now the other thing I'm going to show you, before we get on to, to music, big time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, go on. Is, is this this is brilliant. All oh, right. Uh, Richard's book about Sterling Rich, Moss. Yeah. About Sterling Moss. And if you go to chapter, um, let's have a look. We go to chapter... Uh, 37. I did have it here before. Where's it gone? There we go. 37. And I'll just read you a tiny extra. It's called Kidnapping yep. Kidnap in Havana. Um, and, and we're talking about the Cuban Grand Prix. And this is the last Grand Prix there ever was. And it, the main Formula One uh, drivers uh, in the world were Fangio, who was an Argentinian, and Sterling Moss, our Brit. And so here by the side of the Sun Splash Boulevard, this is by the Hotel National on the Malecon, 
On Sunday, 23rd of February, 1958, sat the young Philip Target Evans, better known a few years later as Phil Manzanera, the guitarist with Roxy Music, one of the most influential rock groups of the 70s. I won't dispute that. He was accompanied by his mother, who had appeared with her husband in a photograph in the previous day's newspaper, socialising at a pre-race function with Sterling Moss and his new wife and members of the staff of the British Embassy. That's so, fantastic. So, you know, I do, in my attic, I have a lot about Cuba, but the revolution came six months later. We had two foreigners had to leave. You know, it was too dangerous. Everyone was getting, like, burgled, and, and we were all put in a hotel and then sent out. And, of course, we went to New York, and then my dad, uh, you know, got posted to Hawaii. There you go. So, and that, then, there we go. Oh, oh wonderful. wow. That's so one nice. of, <laughs> One of my records from Hawaii. Yep. And of course, you know, I started playing guitar in Hawaii. They have the ukulele. And so, you know, continued another four string. Well, that, that was a four string. And then eventually we were there when it became an American state. Right. And then eventually we, uh, he got sent, because of my mother's Spanish speaking, he got sent to Venezuela, Caracas, Venezuela. <clears throat> and it's true that, uh, you know, you could get certain records there. But what happened that was absolutely incredible, this happened uh -huh. in 1958, Elvis. And you could get his films. And that completely was just so incredibly exciting. But in, in Venezuela, you could get certain British records. <laughs> oh, goodness. Jerry and the Pacemakers. But most important of all, you could get The Shadow. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> you know, EMI had a very good distribution. Yeah, they did. Didn't they? Yeah. All over the world, they had studios they built so they were yeah. really ahead of the game and there was a few venezuelan bands of no significance but they're los dangers yeah um but me and my uh, venezuelan friend <clears throat> at school we saw all these american college kids coming over every in the vacations and uh, playing at parties and they would play Buddy Holly and Chuck Berry and stuff like that. And me and my Venezuelan friend looked at them, looked at the girls in our class, said, we got to tool up. we got to get guitars. we got to get electric guitars. <clears throat> and there was um, a, an English boy who was at boarding school in England who came over who had a famous Lorelei electric acoustic guitar. And he sold it to me and showed me a few Chuck Berry riffs and that was it. You know, I, 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 I was off. Um, but, you know, I still loved South American music. And this, Armando Manzanero, actually, he only died last year. He's a Mexican uh, singer and songwriter and incredibly famous of Boleros. So Boleros, for me, were ingrained in me. So th this is um, important because, you know, my life before Roxy was <laughs> quite different. You know, things like this yes. were yeah. sort of seminal, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This was incredibly exciting. It ticked a lot of boxes. There were Latinos. It was New York. It was very exciting. And obviously, incredible music and still is. Incredible yeah, music. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so that was fabulous. But I begged my parents, I used to listen to the World Service in Venezuela and begged my parents to send me to England, even though I was nine, ten. And uh, they sent me to a boarding school in uh, South London, Dulwich College. And, um, and then I really started to learn. And then the Beatles happened and psychedelia happened and Hendrix happened and it was the most incredible time to be a musician and to learn 
how to play because all the boys, were, they could always play well. And I'd say, can you show me how to play that? And then I would learn how to play it. You slow down records and things. And then um, they'd always say, you're playing it wrong. And so I thought, you know what? I'm going to build a career out of playing it wrong. <laughs> so that was my, you know, I decided at school that we formed bands and things. But my father died in Venezuela when I was 15. When I was 16, uh, I, uh, the following year, I said to my, my mother, who was a sweet, you know, Colombian lady, had no idea, hardly spoke English, uh, had no idea. I said, I want to be in a band, you know. She said, oh, band, a rock band, a rock, rock, pop band, what? Que, que es eso? <laughs> uh, I said, look, and my brother said, look, I think you're going to have to stay at school, take your exams or whatever. But I'll tell you what, let's go and speak to somebody. I have a friend, because he, he'd been up at Cambridge, my brother. So I have a friend who's just joined a band. And uh, let's go and become a professional musician. Let's go and talk to him, get some advice from him. Ask him what you have to do to become a professional musician. And that person was David Gilmore. Oh, wow. So, you know, when we finished our lunch... He then went back and I, we went with him to his apartment, which is the famous one in uh, Earl's Court. Oh, right. I think where Sid may even have lived. Yeah. And yeah. Um, he got his guitar and off he went to Abbey Road to start, you know, recording on uh, Source Full of Secrets, which Sid was on as well. <laughs> he couldn't make it. He says he can't remember a thing about our lunch, but it must have been great, the advice he gave me, because... You know, four years later, I ended up in a band. <clears throat> I'm trying so, to think how young you would all have been. You would have been about 17 or something around this time, maybe 16, I, 17. I, I was 16, turning yeah. 17. And he wouldn't have been much older because he's pretty young, isn't he? No, he, he, he was 21. 21. Yeah, yeah. At that time, it seems like enormous age. Yeah. You know, if you remember when you were at school, if someone was 18 or 17 or 18 and you're yeah. like 13, you know, yeah. you don't get a look in at all but um you know if you know when you're young if you can see somebody being successful a bit you know or know somebody it really helps you to get into that job yeah if you, you know what i mean and um, the other person i knew was robert wyatt and so basically in 68 i knew two people who were in the coolest band yeah. Yeah, Soft Machine and, 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 and Pink Floyd. You couldn't get cooler than that then. And um, that gave me the sort of impetus to, you know, to keep, you know, to keep, you know, trying. So, you know. And what kind of music were you playing then in these groups? This was at Dulwich College. What, yeah. What, what, well, what, what, what kind of music was it? Well, basically, it was a copy of Soft Machine. <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of... Prog rock, and eventually we recorded an album in 1975. It's called Quiet Sun, and course, uh, you know the, the drummer ended up forming a band called This Heat, which was yes. loved by John Peel and stuff. And uh, Bill McCormick joined Robert Wyatt's group, Matching yeah, yeah, Mob. Yeah. yeah, and then he was a band called Random Hold, and he gave up. Um, and also, we were sort of helped by Bill's brother, called. Ian and his pen name. Oh, Ian, oh Ian yes. McDonald. Ian McDonald. Oh, Ian McDonald. Yes. It, all, it all links up. This is it does. <laughs> it does link up, doesn't it? It's all connected. <laughs> I remember <laughs> interviewing you when he died, Ian McDonald. I rang you up and you were on a yacht yes. somewhere. Very sweetly gave me the most moving account of, of your early memories. of It, it was... It, in fact, on that boat trip, I was with my kids in off Mallorca, actually. We hired a, a catamaran. And it was very sad. You know, he had been very, you know, a good friend, a very influential, yeah. and <clears throat> helped me formulate what the hell I should be doing. And, uh, you know, he, he wrote a, a, a very great description of me, which summed me up totally, like, you know, like, sort of hopeless, but great, you know, or whatever. <laughs> uh, um, you know, uh, it's a sweet, um, 
but um, yeah, actually, on, when you rang me, funny enough, I was I wrote a song on that called "Wish You Well," and I recorded a version of that with Chrissy Hind, who oh, knew lovely. it as well. Yeah, yeah, on one of my solo albums. <clears throat> and Bill, I got Bill McCormick to play a sort of elegiac bass solo on it to his brother. So it's oh, all lovely. very, uh, very sort of connected, which is nice about <clears throat> music musicians in London, especially those who grew up in the 60s and 70s, you know, we all bump into each other, very, very friendly. It's still, you know, have a laugh with a lot of them. <clears throat> so so I I basically, you know, was doing a prog rocky type thing and Quiet Sun has become quite uh, a collector's item, the album actually. <clears throat> and, you know, Eno helped out on it and all sorts of stuff. And, um, but, but I, I, I get ahead of myself really uh, after school, I answered an ad in the Melody Maker because I'd read about uh, the Roxy demo that had been sent in by Brian to Richard Williams. And, and uh, the week before, we had a little write-up from Richard about Quiet Sun. Oh, and in which uh, Richard said, <clears throat> the best thing about this is the uh, press handout. <laughs> written by uh, uh, written by written by McDonald's. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> this was before he was at the enemy before yeah. he, he joined. Yeah. Um, so um, I, we we looked at uh, at the Roxy demo one, and me and Bill said, "Wow, that, they sound great." You know, the demos sound great. And Bill then joined Robert White's group, and I thought, "Oh, well, what am I going to do now?" So he said, "Well, why don't you?" There's an ad in the Melody Maker, that they're looking for a guitarist. And here it is. Oh, you've still got so, that? Not wow. Oh, it lovely. Like, read it out. What does it say? Okay, it says, in inverted commas, the perfect guitarist for Avant yes. Rock Group. That's it. Original, comma, creative. Yes, thank you. Uh, comma, adaptable. Yep. Melodic, tick. Fast. Yep. No, not so fast. Slow. Yep. <laughs> Elegant, witty, scary, stable, tricky, yeah, tick, quality musicians only. Brilliant. And the phone number, which was where Andy and, and Brian shared a little house in Battersea. They were both teachers, of course. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so, so I went along for the audition and I got on really well with them. <clears throat> but um, I failed. I failed the audition. Is so, it David O'List who got David the job? O'List. David O'List. Yeah. Now, David O'List was a fantastic guitarist. I'd seen him play at the Albert Hall on the famous uh, tour with Hendrix and the Nice and the Move and Pink Floyd with, with Sid. Um, and that first album by the Nice was incredible. Thoughts of Emily Stabjack. <clears throat> but um, so, yeah, I thought, well, fair play. Actually, I think he's better than me, so that's good. <laughs> and then uh, a friend of mine was doing a light show. This is the bizarre thing for the friends of friends of the Tate Christmas party just off Tottenham Court Road. And who should be playing but Roxy, the embryo of Roxy music? So <clears throat> I go with my friend, and uh, a van pulls up, driven by Brian Ferry, <clears throat> and the the. the uh, the door opens and, and he gets out and Andy and uh, Paul get out the front and they open the back and there's Eno slotted in with all of the cabinets and things because he's <laughs> small, you know. And also at that, at that stage, Eno wouldn't be allowed on stage because he made everyone too nervous. So he mixed from the middle of the aud audience. When I say audience, there's about 20 people. <laughs> but I stood there and I watched them humping all the gear in except for David. And of course, he'd been in a professional band. So he wasn't going to carry it. He wasn't going to carry it. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. Brian Ferry is quite happy to drive the band, <laughs> but David O'List is not going to touch an, an so, amplifier. Well, uh, so I felt sorry for them. So I, I did help them, you know, with, with some of these famous uh, cabinets <clears throat> that they had to match. And so I, I kept bumping into them all over the place. And then I got a call... Um, Actually, it's the first week in February, uh, 1972. I got a call, and I know that because I actually found my diary. Oh, oh fantastic. 
from That's 1972. The actual diary. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. The actual diary. And I hadn't looked at it probably since 1972. <laughs> um, but I found it. And um, so I got this call. I was working as a temp in this um, <clears throat> company in the East End, uh, sorting out financial invoices for people. Everyone was temps and they were making airplanes out of the invoices. The company went bust. <laughs> you know, the, I got this call from, from Brian Ferry saying, do you fancy coming and mixing the sound? I said, well, I've got no idea how to mix this up. He said, don't worry, Eno will teach you. I said, okay. <clears throat> so I turn up to this derelict house in Notting Hill, um, which belonged to a friend of theirs, but seemed to have electricity. And uh, they were all there. <clears throat> Dave Odis wasn't there, but his guitar was there. I said, okay, well, you know, what do I do? They said, uh, well, don't worry, just look. Dave said, why don't you just have a go on the guitar? And they were secretly auditioning me <clears throat> again. So this is the first week in February. And but the night before, I had a little bit of a premonition. So I listened to the John Peel sh uh, show that they'd done in early January. And I learned the numbers. <clears throat> so they said, um, right. This number, not that Roxy numbers are complicated, and you have about three or four chords anyway. <laughs> so this one goes like this. I say, okay, well look, show me, and then and then I'll try and uh, see for it. So they played it, and they said, okay, let's go. They play it, and I just played it straight off. So, wow, okay, another one. Blah, blah, blah. Play it well. <laughs> they said, oh, would you like to join? <laughs> Is this genius? <laughs> <laughs> Well, did you, you did you confess in the end that you learned them first? Only years later. Years yeah, later. Goes like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that was like first week of February. I just looked in my diary. So on the the thirty first of January, I turned twenty one and I didn't have a gig. By the Wednesday, I seemed to be playing at the Hand and Flowers with them. And on the fourteenth of February, we signed the first contract. And so that's two weeks later. Um, four weeks later, we were in the studio yeah, recording yeah. this album. And eight weeks later, it was in number four. So it was like I was just in the right place at the right time. But, you know, um, weren't they lucky to get me? They were. They were. <laughs> After rejecting me. What a, a, incredible how much happened because you went off to America very soon after, didn't you? And supported, I can't try to remember now, was it? Was Jethro it Jethro Tull. Tull? Jethro Tull. Yeah, Alice Cooper, and uh, maybe Bowie, I can't remember now. But I mean, no, no, not, no, actually, no, we did support Bowie um, yeah. at the, the in London, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, actually, the first time we supported him was at the uh, Greyhound in Croydon. Right. Oh, God. And uh, when, when I used to bump into David, um, you know, before he died and stuff, quite a few times. And, and, yeah. and he would say, Phil, Phil, if I had a quid for everybody who said they were at the Croydon right. Greyhound gig, I'd be a millionaire. Yeah, yeah. I said, hang on, you are a millionaire, but I know <laughs> what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah, so we supported, and, you know, I came in early because my um, indoors lived at a pub in Bromley. And uh, so I came in before the band. I came upstairs and into the empty, you know, it wasn't that big. And there they were all sat on chairs, all dressed in their Ziggy Stardust costumes. And I was just in my civvies, you know, I felt, oh shit. You know, are you meant to dress up like you do on stage <laughs> normally? <laughs> and said, hi, I'm Phil and all this. They were so lovely and so sweet. And he was so helpful and the whole of his life was so generous. And he had us um, supporting him at the Rainbow. Yeah. And he he loved us and he helped us, you know, considerably. And, um, you know, right up until uh, in the 2000s when we were playing New York, he'd come with his band uh, and uh, be on the side of the stage and everything. So um, that was... Really good. So yeah, we we went, but uh, in the early American tour, yeah, we supported Marlo, that's uh, um, oh, God. Santana's brother yeah, yeah, in yeah. Fresno, where they threw water bombs at us. I mean, we had a lot of water bombs thrown at us all over the world, basically <laughs> that first couple of years, because people 
were like outraged, like how dare they wear that stuff? And we would just continue playing through all this stuff, you yeah. know. Uh, and uh, but, but it was character building. <laughs> it was character building. <laughs> That's amazing. Have you got more stuff to show us from that era? Yes. Uh, let's see. What have I got? Well. Well, I, I could show you my. Um, I can say that guitar looks familiar. Yes. <laughs> can you see it? Well, I can see a guitar. Yeah, I see. That, that is the Red Firebird, right, which yeah. used on every album, even now the latest recordings, and um, it's on the cover of the second "For Your Pleasure." If you open yes. it up, and this <clears throat> this was um, a. Um, a guitar that I, I bought again, I found it in the back of Melody Maker at the time. They had a instruments for sale section. And um, so it just said red guitar, you know. So I went along right. to uh, Regents and I'd had a red Hoffner Galaxy when I was about 10, which is another story. Uh, I got an HP agreement and then was sued when I was 10 uh, from uh, this shop in Surbiton. Um, and uh, I went along to this very posh house in Regent's Park and I knocked on the door and the guy opened the door and he had the fiber and he just, you know, went like that. I said, wow, it is, it's red. And, and you know, I, I thought, well, this is, looks very roxy. This. And the guy had, had lived, he was American, he lived in Kalamazoo and his parents had bought him that guitar uh, for his, uh, I don't know, 16th birthday or something. And the interesting thing about that guitar is that it was designed by Ray Dietrich. He used to be a car designer in the 50s of American cars. So you can see, you know, the fin at the back of a, of a like an old Chevy or something. Yeah. Like that. And, um, but the interesting thing is it's red and, and there was a custom car color chart you could order it from the factory in Kalamazoo and very very rare as it turned out right. they're all brown I've seen pictures of uh, Keith Richards one and uh, uh, Brian Jones had one, but nobody's got a red one <clears throat> so that um, and it just sounds absolutely brilliant so you know I, I uh, I've had that always with me you know it's my go-to guitar you know do you collect guitars? I try not to, no. Right. <laughs> the thing is, I, I did, um, <clears throat> I, I got over it, you know. I have got a few guitars. I mean, here I've got a very nice 1951 Telecaster, which I use. Well, you probably yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> But uh, those are the two, and I've had that since 1973. It's on... Both these guitars are all on all the Roxy albums. Right. The main stage. And, um, but, you know, when I was working with David Gilmore, um, he had, you know, Strat 001 just sitting there. So while the two of us were just like in a room together, because he lives near him, um, <clears throat> every day for months and months and months, I would just be there. I'd just pick it up and have a go, you know. So it, it sort of cures you. Yeah. You, mad desire to have vintage guitars you know and he yeah. had he's got some amazing guitars which it's very hard to to upstage someone who has strat zero zero one <laughs> yeah <laughs> but he sold it and gave oh, it right. to charity a few years ago he sold his whole guitar collection about two three years ago and gave the money to climb it uh climb i remember thing uh, um, yes he sold the house too yeah 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 that was so you work that. with all sorts of people i mean after roxy just a huge number of people yeah. um you know gilmore obviously being one of them and, and robert white and nico uh is there anybody that uh, any of those projects that were just particularly interesting and particularly memorable <clears throat> i was you know i was a big velvet underground fan yeah so just even you know meeting john kale um was fantastic to start with <laughs> and um and then meeting nika and actually working on nika she's like a goddess 
you know, and um, I'd been working on John Kale, sort of helping produce John Kale's album called Fear. Oh, with, right, yeah. uh, with, uh, in fact, I, I was sort of doing it with John Wood, who's the, an great, the great John Wood. Yeah. The great John Wood, the fantastic John Wood at his studio where all those famous yeah, yeah. early Pink Floyd uh, records were made and uh, Fairport Nick Convention, Mention, Nick Drake, <clears throat> you, you name it. And um, let's put it this way. John was absent a lot. <clears throat> so I was getting a bit bored. So I rang Eno and said, look, do you fancy coming working on John Cale's album? Because he's hardly ever here. <clears throat> so he came over and we started just doing all sorts of crazy things. And he was treating my guitars and doing, you know, <clears throat> and then anyway, so <clears throat> that finished. And then John was producing Nika. <clears throat> so he said, do you fancy coming and playing? And, uh, you know, came to. And uh, so, but well, there was a wonderful sweet moment because <clears throat> the control room was up above. And uh, yeah, sure. he went down some stairs, a bit like sort of Abbey Road scenario. Sound technique. No, it wasn't called sound technique. It, it, yes, it was. It was just off King's Road, wasn't it? Oh, just off King's yes, Road. Joe Boyd. Oh, Kensington Church Street or whatever. Yes, yeah. Kensington Church Street. That's right. And um, anyway, so I go, I go down, to put plug in my guitar, play, <clears throat> test it out, and Nico comes down, <clears throat> and she looks up to the control room and she says, "Don't do a thing that that." crazy man says, do whatever you want to do and just ignore him completely. You know, she was so sweet and so funny. I could, you know, it wasn't what I was expecting. Yeah, That's yeah. my main memory. Yeah. Of, but, you know, we played, I played on a track called The End, The Doors cover, and super crazy and super doomy. And I'd love The Doors. So, you know, it was, it, that was a great <clears throat> experience. But... You know, there, there's so many, um, you know, I've done a lot of albums and, and worked on and, and produced. And, you know, I, I ended up um, really doing a lot of work. After Roxy stopped working on our, after the Avalon, there's this great long period where we didn't really work at all together. We played on each other's albums a little bit, but... <clears throat> I went back to my roots, my South American roots, and I started producing uh, bands from Spain and South America, but rock and Espanol, it's, it's a genre now. <clears throat> in fact, there's just been a Netflix documentary came out two weeks ago <clears throat> about one of the bands I produced, which is like, uh, the, called Heroes del Silencio, who are huge and, and you know, the singer, it's gone solo, <clears throat> but he can play. He, they've all won Grammys, I think, Latin Grammys uh, for rock <clears throat> in Espanol. And he, I mean, he played places like 300,000 people in Mexico, in Socorro Square. You know, I mean, he is huge in South America. There's an hour and a half doco on Netflix about them. They, 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 you know. So I did a lot of bands and famous artists from Argentina, from Colombia, from Mexico, because I could speak Spanish. No, I understand what they were what they were singing about. And you know, also I had the chops because I'd learned about production from Chris Thomas, who who oh, of course. produced the Roxy Arms and was a good friend. And obviously working with Eno a lot. Yeah. And between the two of them, I had, you know, the, the tradition of George Martin passed down to me via Chris Thomas, you know, who'd worked on the White Album and mm, yeah. and um, and then all the experimenting I did with with Eno uh, before Roxy and after Roxy as well. So and the thing you the thing you've done most recently, you've been you've been working with Tim Finn again, and that's, that's got right. a South which, American which takes you too. back yeah. to Split End. You produced Split Ends, didn't you? I did. Well, um, yeah, I mean, Roxy went to Australia for the first time in 1975. And it's a, it's a very long journey. And those days, you know, typical POM thing is that you think that's the backwater. It's all like a bunch of hillbillies out there. So I get to Sydney and I collapse on the bed 
after 22 hour flight, I turn on the telly and I just go, what the, it was split ends. They had come over from uh, New Zealand. New Zealand. They're on a TV show. I thought, Jesus, these, how did this happen? This can't be happening. And then <laughs> the next day I would go to the gig and they're the support act. All oh, right, of course. So I watched them from the side of the stage and then I, I, when they went back to their dressing room, I walked by and I popped my head in and said, you guys were great. Anything I can do to help, just let me know. And then I continued on. So they uh, went to, the, actually, they recorded their first album in Australia. But then they decided that it would be better if they came and re-recorded it <laughs> with Phil Manzanera producing. And, uh, you know, in Basing Street with the whole, my crew of people, you know, and Eno popped in and all sorts of stuff. <clears throat> and so they appeared in London in 76, 77, just before punk. And uh, they were wacky and crazy and fantastic. And uh, then punk came and it all became very tribal. And uh, Tim yeah. was telling me that they did a gig at St. Martin's Art School and there were a lot of punks and, and, and people coming there. and. When he came out afterwards, there was an argument going on with a whole bunch of punks saying, but they're not punk. <laughs> and the other guy said, they're fucking good, though. He said, I don't care, but they're not punk. You know, there you go. Like, it was sort of Stalinist type sort of, you're out. It was. And, and Obviously, NME readers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but luckily, you know, Andy Mackay told me that he bumped into Sid Vicious uh, somewhere who said, some nice things about Roxy. So, <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. shame about Brian Ferry. He's an absolute. You know, <laughs> um, so, um, but you know, Sex Pistols use Chris Thomas, and yeah. uh, Chris Bedding, you know, you know, help them as well. You know, so our sort of, our, and it really was the same kind of thing. You know, that we thought that you know when we started, we said we were inspired amateurs. And basically, we knew a few chords. We didn't want to be too technical. If you had a good idea in three chords, you could be successful. Mm -hmm. You just had to have an idea, have a concept, have something, you know. And obviously, fashion and music have always been totally interlinked, you know. So, um, yeah. So, and then, you know, Tim would come over every now and again. Uh, I saw him uh, in the 80s when I started... <clears throat> revisiting my Latin roots. And so he came and sang on a couple of tracks. He happened to be in the UK. <clears throat> then he went to Cuba. Uh, uh, and, uh, and then I saw him again in the 90s. And just generally, when, actually, funny enough, I was in um, LA when they were mixing Woodface and uh, with Bob Clearmountain, who mixed the Roxy stuff. <clears throat> And uh, so I went along to the studio and obviously there's great songs. Tim was, at that point, he was in Crowded House. And they did a, um, they did a little show for MTV and, and they said, do you want to come along? I came along, I said, do you want to come on stage? So <clears throat> I went and I was sort of playing with it. And suddenly without them telling me, they broke into Love is the Drug. <laughs> and I was like, what, what were you? You know, they were just Gorgeous. So, so much fun. Um, that, you know, and, and uh, so I kept bumping into them at different times. And, um, you know, because Neil had been sent to me uh, actually in London in 78 or something like that to um, have a few, not guitar lessons, but he was really acoustic guitar player. And so he had, wasn't used to playing electric guitar. So he came to my house and we went through you know, electric guitar and amps and, and, and a few things like that. So that was when, because he, he, he was too young to join the band mm. briefly, but then when uh, Phil Judd left, he then joined. So anyway, scroll forward to um, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which Roxy were inducted in 2019. So we're in New York, and, and that's the last time we played together as Roxy. Um, <clears throat> And uh, Stevie Nicks won an award as well. And so Hall of Fleetwood Mac were there and Neil was there. All so right, he was subbing for Lindsay Buckingham. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he invited us to the party afterwards. 
So I sent Tim a picture of me and Neil and um, said, look who I bumped into in New York. So then Tim said, oh, look, we're doing, um, we're doing a few tracks. Um, do fancy playing some guitar on it? So I ended up playing, he was doing, he was doing some tracks for an album that's going to come out, actually, with other members of Splitlands in um, October or November. So I play, ended up playing like 12 tracks. And then a year ago, uh, on the 3rd of April, he sent me an email, have you got any Latin kind of groove tracks that I could write something to? So I sent him a couple of things. And, uh, you know, as uh, Neil Young said, rust never sleeps. So I have tons of stuff always lying around, waiting for the right moment. And I said, and my God, you know, there's a time difference between the UK and uh, Auckland. I send him stuff and the next morning I'd wake up and it would come back with singing and words on it. Yeah. And this happened 20 times. And I was absolutely, I thought this guy is a genius. <clears throat> you know, I have over my, next year will be 50 years, by the way, the Roxy, you know, yeah. our anniversary. Yeah. So I've sort of been a professional musician for 50 years, really. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I can count the, the people I've written with, actual songs with Brian Ferry, Brian Eno, David Gilmore, Godly and Cream, uh, the Colombian guy, you know, that, that's sort of it. Tim Finn is like the most satisfying person to write songs with because I just tend to do music because I feel that the people who sing the song should really have written the words. I, I really believe that. I mean, I, I did three albums with me singing because there were words that I thought, I'm not giving these to they're so personal, um, you know, but I'm not, I got fed up with trying to sing, so I'm not singing anymore. Um, but he, he's, those Finn brothers, they've got like the gene in them, you oh, know, yeah. they're, they're they Irish, have. Irish descent. They you know? have. And their words, and Tim's words, I mean, obviously, I'm saying this, you haven't heard it, but we will actually bring out uh, an album of 10 of the tracks in, in August. There's an EP coming out on the 18th of June, which has four tracks on it. But um, I, I'm in awe of this guy. I, I mean, he, he is just fantastic. Yeah. And um, I have also filmed a series of little uh, having a chat things, me and Tim, where we uh, on Zoom. Um, and we filmed that a couple of weeks ago. <clears throat> And when we came on to the Zoom, we said, hang on, this is the first time we see each other. We haven't actually seen each other, and yet we never thought of going on Zoom before. <laughs> so it's all been done at arm's length, you know, through email. Very unusual to do that without actually, uh, actually seeing each other at all. So it was all done just by email and, and audio. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I don't think you'd mind me saying he's a bit technically challenged, but, you know, when we did the Zoom... <laughs> I was taking channels. I was saying, do you know sign language? You know, where's the bloody audio? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, anyway, we, we ended up doing it and had an incredible laugh. But I said, if we'd actually started by using Zoom, we never would have written any song. No, you'd just have been Yeah, it's true. You were wasting a lot of time just to be gossiping all day. But, but also, you, you've, got, you've obviously <laughs> got an ideal 24-hour production cycle, haven't you? You're, you're in one time zone, sublime music. And he's then, yeah, when so you go while, to bed... While you're asleep, he's, he's writing... I know, <laughs> twice as fast, actually. It's ideal. Yes. I mean, I, I sent him three new tracks seven days ago. I swear to God, they came back the next day. Yeah. Written. I, I just... I thought, what can I send to you? I've sent him the weirdest stuff you can possibly imagine. Everything from conventional songs to really weird yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. Never write something on that. Nah. I said, you know... <laughs> He comes back with something every time. It's just like uncanny, uncanny. Yeah, I've got to ask you about their Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. What yeah. lineup of Roxy music was was inducted, to use the expression? So, how how many of you were there? Right. Well, um, Brian Ferry. Yep. Andy Mackay. 
me, obviously, Phil Manzer, Eddie Jobson. Right. Oh, yeah. Eno did a very Eno thing. Uh, he said, I'm not, um, for environmental reasons, I'm not flying. flying. Yeah, yeah. So, sorry, lads. I'm very happy that, you know, it, it's, you've got it or it's, it, we've got it or whatever, but I'm not flying. And Paul Thompson, um, he had a slight little problem with his heart and stuff and, and didn't want to risk flying right. over there, which we, we, we or playing. And I said, we all said, oh, Paul, please just come, just stand there and wave or whatever. Uh, but he wouldn't, you know, he's a quite, Strong Geordie and what did you play? We well, controversially, we started. (laughs) I mean, every dream home of heartache. I said, Why are we doing this? (laughs) It's about a sex doll. This is going to be cut straight away. This is not going to be shown. Yes, not very, it's not very uh contemporary, is it? (laughs) It was Brian's idea. Hey, look. You know, I get to play a big guitar solo up then. Thanks, that's great. But you know, really, yeah, couldn't <laughs> really playing. And then we did a very quick medley of because it took up so much time. Yeah, it would. Of more than this, Avalon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, out of the blue, because Eddie Jobson was there, played electric right, violin, yeah, yeah. and uh, maybe one other song. But it was it was great actually because we really you know we was like. Here's a bunch of old geezers. You've got to acquit yourself well. <laughs> you know, you haven't played together for six years. You, so we rehearsed, you know, in uh, Brooklyn. And, uh, you know, he said, oh, please go and let my guitar work. And, and you know, because it's sudden death. And there are all those famous bands playing and all those, you know, places full of, like, famous people. You know, I stood up and thought, oh, my God, this is, like, so, this is, like, so... This that must America. be more unnerving than the idea of the viewing audience by a long shot. Oh, no, so, so yeah. it must be seeing Bruce Springsteen in the front row or whatever, you know. Well, yeah, all these people. Um, he wasn't there, but it would have been great. But, um, yeah, so I thought, do a good job, you know. And um, actually, one of the funny things, and you have a, a run through the day before. So um, the guy said, uh, okay, who's going to speak? And, uh, you know, we thought, well, okay, let's let Brian speak. Uh, I said, no, no, we'll all say a little bit. Most bands, everyone says a little bit. And, and, and anyway, the, the teleprompter was miles away. I can't see that far. I said, I, I can't, I can't speak. I can't even see the thing. You know, it's, even with glasses, I can't see it. Through. Forget it. And, but the guy, the stage manager is the TV guy. So he says, okay, when you finish doing your, your speech, Go behind the back curtain, put your in ears in that you need for playing on stage. <clears throat> Go to your position and, and then start. When you're ready, start, because we can edit it. So we, we do the talking bits and, and, and everything. And uh, um, we go back to the black curtain and Andy puts his in and, and walks out off. And Brian puts in and walks off. And there's a problem with my in ears. And the, the roadies... Panic, not panicking, but the other two managed panic. They're all panicking. I said, well, and then I hear that song start. <laughs> I said, hang on, they Wait said, do not start till you're all ready. So, so anyway, my daughter and Claire and wife were sitting at the table and they're sort of saying, so people say, dad, where's dad? And, and Claire said, he's, he's not there, Wait, what's happened? You know, so after they start, um, about 30 seconds later, I walk calmly across the whole stage, oh, pick up my guitar, and they said, oh, that was so cool, <laughs> you know, that you, you did that thing. But anyway, it all went well, and we played great. And uh, so we acquitted ourselves well. So, you know, it was, I thought, well, if that's the last time we ever play together, I'm happy we ticked that box. So that's the question I've got to ask. It's 50 years next year. Are you going to play again together? Because ideally, shouldn't there be a tour? Surely. <laughs> if it's possible, which it looks like it might be. Well, who knows with, with, with COVID? Let's, let's put it this way. COVID is like a big game of snake and ladders. You know, you go up one thing and suddenly you go, mm, yeah, that's that's true. we've got no idea what's going to happen. It's a sort of global game of snake and ladders. But, um, you know, if, the, if the, ever there was a time, it would be 
you know, next year. But, uh, you know, we don't have a manager. We haven't had a manager for 30 years. So if we want to do something, we just bring each other up and say, fancy doing that. Yeah. And, and, and we do. So it's sort of nice. Uh, it's sort of low key. There's no pressure from anybody. So, you know, who knows? Who knows? Well, let's, uh, let's hope it happens. But look, the, 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 the traditional way that we end these is yeah. with, 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 with uh, people's nomination for the greatest record ever made, which is yeah. a very difficult thing to do, put people on the spot. But I mean, well, look, if, if, if I said to you, looking behind your record collection, you can only take one of those with you to Desert Island, you know, you know what it's like. Oh, it's, oh, really, well, it's yeah. impossible. Oh, and, that's and, a, it's, 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 not, every day. it's not the okay. Desert Island question. It's a slightly no, no. different question. Okay. But anyway, go on. Yeah. Okay, well, let me just break down that question. <laughs> What is the best record ever made? That's different to now. I, you know, I would say, you know, if I, I'm still, you know, I would say obviously either Sgt. Pepper or Pep Sounds, the best record ever made from a production point of view, yeah. and technically yeah. and lyrically, and it's not necessarily the album that I would like to. No. You know, I'm sort of bored of listening to. No, no, it's a personal I, choice. I do recognise. What means a lot to you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would actually go for Revolver. Right. Personally, you know, I was so excited by the Beatles. It's the reason I'm, I'm sitting here now. It, it, it just excited me so much. Uh, everything about the Beatles, you know. So, um, and that album has Tomorrow Never Knows, which yeah, I, yeah. I adore and I, you know, and, and we did a version. What well, if you did a version, did not you? 801 yeah, Live or whatever it was. Yes. And, and it is uh, what the most uh, played track on Spotify of mine. I really... I no, <laughs> in theory, it's not mine because it's with Eno and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It seems to appear on my Spotify thing. It's the oh. most... Because it has the most incredible drummer in the world, Simon Phillips. Simon Phillips. Yeah. And... Uh, you know, it has uh, Francis Monkman and Eno and... Uh, yeah. Was that the key um, track for you when you heard it at the time, when you would have been, I'm trying to work out, 15 or whatever? I mean, was that the one that really <laughs> leapt out? Because that, be, that would be a very sophisticated view. Well, it, it, it was because, you know, I also was into, uh, just like a lot of us were, exper listening, you know, to Frank yeah. Sapper, and then who was, you know, he's influenced by Charles Ives. What's Charles Ives? And, you know, all, all the uh, uh, systems music and stuff, you know, there was just so much music yeah. being exposed and, and in the 60s and the mid-60s uh, that, uh, and you felt you're on a journey with the Beatles, you know, as well. Yeah. You know, they were into avant-garde things and everything. So Absolutely. anything that they were, you yeah. know, into, and then, what's the Book of the Dead, you know? Well, and nothing was surprising in the Beatles record. Nothing no. at all. They've just well, obviously, it's the Beatles. They yeah. do, and Doing there's what yellow, they do. there's yellow submarine, there's and submarine. There's, uh, there's all kinds of things. You know, that's just what it is. That's what they do. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. yeah to totally. You know, but at the same time, everything things were slightly changing. You know, and then Hendrix appeared, and they had the soft machine sort of thing, and then you know the, the Beach Boys. I'd watched the Beach Boys on telly in uh, in like nineteen. 58, no, no, 1959, when I was passing through New York to go to um, with the stripy shirts. Yeah. So you know, I knew all about the speech of the pet sounds, obviously, the production, everything is absolutely incredible. But um, Revolver, well, my, great choice, though. Revolver is your choice. Oh, it's a great it's choice. It's a fine choice. Great, thank you. It's been lovely talking to you. It's Real been delight. Absolutely fantastic. And <laughs> And we look forward to your EP in June. Yes, in, on the 18th of June. On but the all the info is on, a, we have a little website that is all done by us, the two of us. It's called finmans.com. Okay, it. we'll put the link. We'll, we'll stick that link, link on the bottom. To, yeah. uh, underneath this. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.